4.2. Conversation 1. Where's my milk? It's not here. I haven't seen it. You must have finished it. I definitely didn't finish it. I was keeping some for my cereal this morning. You must have used it. Me? I never take anything from the refrigerator that isn't mine. You might have given it to the cat last night and then forgotten about it. The cat drinks water, not milk, so I couldn't have given it to the cat. Last night there was half a carton of milk in the refrigerator. My milk. Well, I don't know what happened to it. What are you drinking? Just coffee. Yes, white coffee. That's where my milk went. Well, you can go to the supermarket and get me some more. Okay, okay, calm down. I'll go and get you some milk. Conversation 2 At the traffic circle, take the second exit. Why are you taking the third exit? She said the second exit. I'm sure it's this one. I remember when we came here last time. According to that sign, this is Sunrise Highway. Sunrise Highway? Oh, no. We must have gone the wrong way. Of course we've gone the wrong way. We should have taken the second exit at the traffic circle. What's the point of having a GPS if you don't do what it says? Okay, I may have made a mistake. But if you knew the way to your cousin's house, then we wouldn't have to use the GPS. Turn around as soon as possible. 4.3 1. You must have finished it. 2. You might have given it to the cat last night. 3. I couldn't have given it to the cat. 4. Oh, no. We must have gone the wrong way. 5. We should have taken the second exit at the traffic circle. 6. Okay, I may have made a mistake. 4.4 1. I must have left my phone at Anna's. I definitely remember having it there. You must have seen something. You were there when the accident happened. 2. Somebody might have stolen your wallet when you were getting off the train. He still hasn't arrived. I may not have given him the right directions. 3. She couldn't have gone to bed. It's only 10 o'clock. You couldn't have seen their faces very clearly. It was too dark. 4.5 We're going the wrong way. We shouldn't have turned left at the traffic light. It's my fault. I should have told you earlier that my mother was coming. 4.6 1. You must have finished it. 2. You might have given it to the cat last night. 3. I couldn't have given it to the cat. 4. Oh, no. We must have gone the wrong way. 5. We should have taken the second exit at the traffic circle. 6. Okay, I may have made a mistake. 4.7. In life, we sometimes have disagreements with people. It could be with your partner, with your boss, with your parents, or with a friend. When this happens, the important thing is to try not to let a difference of opinion turn into a heated argument. But, of course, it's easier said than done. The first thing I would say is that the way you begin the conversation is very important. Imagine you're a student and you share an apartment with another student who you think isn't helping out with the housework. If you say, look, you never help out with the housework, what are we going to do about it? The discussion will turn into an argument. It's much more constructive to say something like, I think we'd better take another look at how we divide up the housework. Maybe there's a better way of doing it. My second piece of advice is simple. If you're the person who's in the wrong, just admit it. This is the easiest and best way to avoid an argument. 
Just apologize to your roommate, your parents, or your husband, and move on. The other person will have much more respect for you if you do that. The next tip is don't exaggerate. Try not to say things like, you always come home late when my mother comes to dinner, when maybe this has only happened once before, or you never remember to buy the toothpaste. This will just make the other person get very defensive because what you're saying about them just isn't true. If you follow these tips, you just might be able to avoid an argument. But if an argument does start, it's important to keep things under control, and there are ways to do this. The most important thing is not to raise your voice. Raising your voice will just make the other person lose their temper, too. If you find yourself raising your voice, stop for a moment and take a deep breath. Say, I'm sorry I shouted, but this is very important to me, and continue calmly. If you can talk calmly and quietly, you'll find the other person will be more ready to think about what you're saying. It's also very important to stick to the point. Try to stay on the topic you're talking about. Don't bring up old arguments or try to bring in other issues. Just concentrate on solving the one problem you're having and leave the other things for another time. So, for example, if you're arguing about the housework, don't start talking about cell phone bills, too. And my final tip is that if necessary, call time out, like in a basketball game. If you think that an argument is getting out of control, then you can say to the other person, listen, I'd rather talk about this tomorrow when we've both calmed down. You can then continue talking about it the next day when maybe both of you are feeling less tense and angry. That way, there's a better chance that you'll be able to reach an agreement. You'll also probably find that the problem is much easier to solve when you've both had a good night's sleep. But I want to say one last thing that I think is very important. Some people think that arguing is always bad, but that isn't true. Conflict is a normal part of life, and dealing with conflict is an important part of any relationship, whether it's three people sharing an apartment, a married couple, or just two good friends. If you don't learn to argue constructively, then when a real problem comes along, you won't be prepared to face it together. Think of the smaller arguments as training sessions. Learn how to argue cleanly and fairly. It will help your relationship become stronger and last longer. 4.8 1. But of course, it's easier said than done. 2. If you're the person who's in the wrong, just admit it. 3. It's important to keep things under control. 4. Raising your voice will just make the other person lose their temper, too. 5. Stop for a moment and take a deep breath. 6. It's also very important to stick to the point. 7. There's a better chance that you'll be able to reach an agreement. 8. Dealing with conflict is an important part of any relationship. 4.9 Verbs often confused 1. I need to discuss the problem with my boss. 2. I often argue with my parents about doing housework. 3. I didn't realize you were so unhappy. 4. I didn't notice that Karen had changed her hair color. 5. Jack always tries to avoid arguing with me. 6. My dad can't prevent me from seeing my friends. 7. I've spoken to her husband twice, and he seems very nice. 8. Carol doesn't look very well. I think she's working too hard. 9. My parents don't mind if I stay out late. 10. It doesn't matter if we are five minutes late. 11. Can you remind me to call my mom later? 12. 
Remember to turn off the lights before you go. 13. I expect that Daniel will forget our anniversary. He always does. 14. We'll have to wait half an hour for the next train. 15. I wish I were a little taller. 16. I hope that you can come on Friday. I haven't seen you for ages. 17. The Dallas Cowboys won the game 28-10. 18. The Dallas Cowboys beat the New York Jets 28-10. 19. Tom always refuses to discuss the problem. 20. Tom always denies that he has a problem. 21. The cost of living is going to rise again this month. 22. It's hard not to raise your voice when you're arguing with someone. 23. Last night, I came home and lay on the sofa and went to sleep. 24. I laid the baby on the bed and changed his diaper. 25. The men had been planning to rob the bank. 26. If you leave your bike unlocked, somebody might steal it. 27. I think I should warn you that Liam doesn't always tell the truth. 28. My teachers are going to advise me on what subjects to study next year. 4.11 I love this photo, especially the way she's using her hands and the expression in her eyes and her mouth. Here, she is in the role of a young single mother who heard a noise in the kitchen in the middle of the night. You can see the fear in her eyes that she's worried about her child, I think she suggests all that beautifully. 4.12 1. You look tired. That cake smells good. These jeans don't feel comfortable. 2. Tim looks like his father. This material feels like silk, is it? Are you sure this is coffee? It tastes like tea. 3. She looks as if she's been crying. It smells as if something's burning. It sounds as if it's raining. 4.13 1. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine.
10. Four point fourteen. One. Here is the actress Cheryl Hines. If you think she looks furious, that's because she is. She's playing a wife who's opening the door to her husband at one o'clock in the morning. Her husband forgot that she was giving a dinner party, and he went off to play poker with his friends and turned his phone off. She looks as if she's going to tell him to leave and never come back. Two. I love this one. This is Jason Schwartzman, and he's playing a five-year-old boy. He's in the process of quietly putting his pet rat into his seven-year-old sister's clothes drawer. He looks pretty confident about what he's doing, and as if he's really looking forward to hearing her scream when she finds it. Three. Here, Ellen Burstyn is playing a high school drama teacher. She is in the audience at the Oscar ceremony, and one of the winners is an ex-student of hers. Her ex-student actually mentions her name when she makes her winner's speech. You can see how proud she is and how moved she is to have been mentioned. Four. In this photo, I see pure horror and fear. This is the actor Dan Hedea. He's playing the part of a long-distance truck driver who was tired and closed his eyes for a few moments. He opens them to see that he's, you guessed it, on the wrong side of the road, with cars racing toward him. Do you think he looks as if he's going to react in time? I think probably not. 5. Here the actress Jane Lynch was given the role of a child. She's swallowing a spoonful of medicine that her mom promised would taste good. Of course it didn't. And now her mom is telling her that if it didn't taste awful, it wouldn't work. She looks as if she's about to spit it out. I can remember reacting just like that when I was a kid, and my mom saying those exact same words. 6. When you look at this last one of Steve Gutenberg, I think you can immediately see from his expression that he's worried and maybe nervous. He's playing the role of a married man who's begging his wife to give him one more chance. But I think he looks as if he's done something bad and is pretty desperate, so I'm not sure if his wife's going to forgive him. 4.15 How difficult is it to express feelings when you can't use body language? Radio acting is a different style of acting from visual acting because obviously you only have your voice uh -huh. to to use but you can use your voice and you can use timing to convey everything mm. when i started off as a radio actor somebody said to me you have to be able to raise one eyebrow with your voice which i loved because you haven't got your body you have to put it into your voice and so therefore the way that a radio actor works isn't totally naturalistic in the way that it would be on the television or on the film. Or What techniques do you use to help you to express emotions, feelings? Well, there's a big difference between speaking with a smile and not speaking with a smile. Ah. There's a huge difference between being happy and being really sad and really angry. Hmm. Is it hard for actors who don't have experience in radio to do radio acting? Well, people don't realise that it is a different technique, but you would get famous people coming in not realising that there was a technique to radio acting and thinking that you could do total naturalism. And it isn't totally naturalistic. Oh. It's as naturalistic as you can make it to, sound, to lift it off the page, to make it sound as though you're not reading it. 4.16 6 Cheek 8 Chin 2 Eyebrow 4 Eyelash 3 Eyelid 1 Forehead 7 Lips. Nine. Neck. Five. Wrinkles. 
4.17. Parts of the body and organs. 3. Ankle. 1. Calf. Calves. 2. Heel. 6. Elbow. 5. Fist. 8. Nails. 4. Palm. 7. Wrist. 12. Bottom. 9. Chest. 13. Hip. 11. Thigh. 10. Waist. 14. Brain. 17. Heart. 16. Kidneys. 15. Liver. 18. Lungs. 4.18. Verbs and verb phrases. A. 1. Bite your nails. 2. Blow your nose. 3. Brush your hair. Brush your teeth. 4. Comb your hair. 5. Fold your arms. 6. Hold somebody's hand. 7. Touch your toes. 8. Suck your thumb. 9. Shake hands. 10. Shrug your shoulders. 11. Shake your head. 12. Raise your eyebrows. 4.19. Verbs and verb phrases. C. 1. Eye. 2. Teeth. 3. Arms. 4. Nails. 5. Hand. 6. Knee. 7. Forehead. 8. Eyes. 9. Mouth. Arms. 10. Finger. 4.20 Fold your arms. Blow your nose. Raise your hand. Scratch your head. Bite your nails. Wink. Stare at the person next to you. Point at the board. Stretch your arms. Shrug your shoulders. Touch your toes. Wave goodbye. 4.21 Calf Wrist Palm Wrinkles Comb Kneel Thumb 4.22 Isle Calm 
climb. Design. Doubt. Fasten. Half. Honest. Knock. Muscle. Whistle. Hole. 4.23. 1. Touching or stroking their neck is a very typical sign that a person is nervous and is trying to calm themselves down. A woman may also play with a necklace, and a man may tighten his tie. 2. When somebody's standing and they point one of their toes upward, this is a clear sign that the person is in a good mood, often because they are thinking about, or have just heard, something positive. If you see someone standing talking on the phone and they suddenly point one foot up, you can be sure that they have just been told some good news. 3. Crossing their legs, whether they're sitting or standing, is a sign that a person feels relaxed and comfortable. If the person is sitting with their legs crossed and their feet toward another person, that shows that they are interested in this person. However, if someone they don't like appears, you may find that they quickly uncross their legs. 4. This position, standing with your hands on your hips and your elbows pointing out, is a pose used to show dominance. If you watch police officers or soldiers, you'll notice that they often use this pose. Men tend to use it more than women, and it's something we teach women executives to do in meetings where there are a lot of men present, to show that they are confident and won't be bullied. 5. We all know that thumbs up is a positive sign, meaning we feel good or approve of something. But what about when somebody puts their thumbs downward in their pockets? As you might guess, this usually means that their confidence is low and that they are feeling unsure of themselves. So try not to do this if you are in a situation where you need to look confident and in control. 6. Putting their head to one side is a powerful sign that a person feels friendly and interested in someone or something. It's an automatic, genuine gesture, unlike a smile, which might be artificial, and so it's a good sign of real interest. It's also very difficult to do naturally around people you don't like. 7. If you look at people in a stressful situation, for example, witnesses who are answering questions in courts, you'll often see that it looks as if their lips have disappeared inward. In fact, this is one of the most universal signs of stress, as if a person wanted to disappear completely. 4.24 Interview with an Actor Part 1 How did you get into acting? I was about 18. It was my first real job. And it was a very unusual job because I was working in the box office of the Old Vic Theatre. Then not only did I get to see an awful lot of plays, but I also met the actors and I was able to sneak in to rehearsals in the theatre quite illegally. And I became fascinated by the work of the theatre. What in particular fascinated you? But the thing that fascinated me, as I said, was when I was in rehearsals, it was this, the work of the theatre, the sort of work it was. So I'd stand at the back of the Ulvik Theatre when the actors were rehearsing. But mostly it consisted of people sitting rather glumly about saying, well, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to make this scene work. I don't understand my character. And the director would try to help them to understand the character or suggest a move here or a move there. Or maybe they'd try walking in a different way or putting on a different hat. And bit by bit, it started to fall into place. And I thought, what a wonderful job. Fantastic, interesting job to wrestle with these kinds of problems, trying to understand the characters, trying to find out how best to express them and show them off. So I, I came to acting very much from that point of view. The role that first made you famous as a young actor was playing Mozart in the original theatre production of Amadeus, which later went on to become a film. What was the most challenging thing about playing the part of Mozart? 
what was a challenge was that Mozart was a person who'd actually lived and was indeed one of the greatest artistic geniuses of the whole of Western civilization. And I was a great lover and admirer of Mozart's music. So there was a tremendous uh, challenge to bridge the character that Peter Schaffer had written. And Peter Schaffer knows all about Mozart as he could, so that Mozart was, was uh, a sort of a, a smutty, uh, a hysterical child, really, uh, in a lot of the play. My job was to reconcile that with the fact that he wrote The Manager Figaro. And that was tremendously hard. Was Mozart one of your most satisfying roles? No, I wouldn't say that that was the most satisfying. It was the most exciting, because it, its fame, uh, f almost from the moment it was announced, was overwhelmingly greater than anything I had ever done, or, to be honest, ever have done since. The fact that the play was very, very controversial when it opened proved to be uh, very uh, um, shocking for many people, only increased the excitement around it. And it was uh, astonishing to look out into the auditorium every night and to see Paul Red Newman or, 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 or Robert Redford or, or, or Arva Gardner or, or Margaret Thatcher sitting out there because everybody had to see that play. 4.25 Interview with an Actor, Part 2 over your career, you have acted in the theatre and you have also acted in many films. Which do you prefer? They're absolutely different media. They require different things from you as an actor. I love them both, but they're each of them completely different. You bring completely different things to them. Obviously, the crucial difference with the theatre is that there's an audience there, and that's such an important aspect of it in every way. It's there important because you have to reach out to them, make sure that everybody can hear and see what you're doing. The beauty of the theatre is that every single performance is utterly different from every other one. How do you motivate yourself to play the same character again night after night? I think as you get older, you realise that um, you never get it right. Uh, I mean, I've... I've probably about half a dozen times in my 40 years of acting, have thought, well, that was a really good performance. Uh, but it can always be better. And so one goes to the theatre every day hoping that it'll be in some way better. Uh, uh, you know, there's always the possibility you might get it right. I mean, you never do, you never can. So what for you is the main difference with film acting? Uh, in movies or television film, which is what almost all television is nowadays, um, a lot of those responsibilities are lie with the director and the editor. And as a, having directed film myself, I know perfectly well that you can make a, a sad scene funny, you can make a slow scene fast uh, uh, in the editing suite. It's, it's a, an astonishing... Uh, power that a director and editor have. Um, uh, uh, you can make a character seem stupid just by editing them in a certain way or make them seem brilliant by editing them in a different way. So in that sense, the actor's rather powerless. Anything else? The other thing that's very hard about acting on film is that hilariously it's regarded as a sort of naturalistic medium, but in no sense is it that for the actor because... You're, you, you know, first of all, there are some you know, little metal objects right in front of you, sort of staring at you as you're doing your love scene or whatever else it might be. 4.26. Interview with an actor. Part 3. Do you enjoy watching other actors acting? Well, I love watching other actors acting. I, I've been obsessed by acting since I was a child and uh, I'm a great connoisseur of it, and I think I'm quite a good judge of it, and uh, so I, I adore watching other actors work when it's good. When it's not, uh, it's a great pain to me. Who were the first great actors you saw? 
as a young man and a boy, I was extraordinarily lucky to see that fabled generation of actors of, of, of Gielgud, Richardson, Olivier, Edith Evans, Peggy Ashcroft, people now almost all completely forgotten. Uh, 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 even if they made movies, it's unlikely that people of a younger generation know who they are. But, but uh, when they were alive and kicking and uh, doing their extraordinary work on stage, uh, it, it, it was something quite, quite remarkable. I mean, it was, it was the sort of thing that nobody attempts anymore. Do any modern actors come close to that golden generation? In uh, movies, not always, but, but, but sometimes Daniel Day-Lewis does, uh, I think, probably approach a role in the way that a Lawton might have approached it. Is there anything you don't like about acting? I don't much like wearing makeup. I sweat a lot, it comes off, it's uncomfortable, it's sticky, you can't... And I, I do everything I can to avoid wearing makeup. Do you still get stage fright? I don't get stage fright, but I do get self-conscious, and I hate that, and I wish I didn't, particularly at the events like First Nights, because I, I don't know how it's impossible to ignore the fact that there are at least 100 people sitting out there judging you, you know... I think almost all actors feel a tremendous longing for the first night to be over, but it has to happen. It's like a sort of operation. It's, it, you, you know it's got to happen, it's going to hurt, but you will feel better afterwards. 4.27. Interview with an actor. Looking at language. One. I thought, what a wonderful job. Fantastic, interesting job. Two. My job was to reconcile that with the fact that he wrote The Manager of Figaro. And that was tremendously hard. Three. Its fame, uh, f almost from the moment it was announced, was overwhelmingly greater than anything I had ever done. Four. They're absolutely different media. They require different things from you as an actor. Five. You bring completely different things to them. Six. The beauty of the theatre is that every single performance is utterly different from every other one. Seven. As a young man and a boy, I was extraordinarily lucky to see that fabled generation of actors, of, of, of Gielgud, Richardson, Olivier. 4.28. On the street. Helene. What actors do you enjoy watching? Um, well, my favorite actors are... Meg Ryan, um, I like Jennifer Aniston, um, all that has to do with friends. <laughs> and um, I like Tom Hanks, Sandra Bullock. Why do you like them? Um, Sandra Bullock, for example, I like her because she's, I mean, she can make different roles and she kills it. <laughs> she's really good at it. Why do you like Sandra Bullock's performance in Miss Congeniality? Um, I like it because she first shows a side of her that is not too girly. She's like, um, I don't care, whatever. And then she showed that she could um, change her character into this girly woman. That was really good. <laughs> Sean. What actors do you particularly enjoy watching? I don't really have a favorite actor, I don't think, but um, I always enjoy watching Robert De Niro. Why do you like him? I think he just has an intensity and a presence that makes you want to watch him, makes you want to think about why he's doing what he's doing. I think even if it's something quite silly, 
um, it's still always interesting to watch. What performance of his do you particularly enjoy? I think my favourite film and my favourite performance of all time is The Deer Hunter. Yvonne. What actors do you particularly enjoy watching? I particularly like watching Christian Bale uh, as an actor and maybe an actress, Anne Hathaway. Which of their performances did you particularly enjoy? I enjoyed Christian Bale as Batman and also in the movie The Prestige. Why do you like Anne Hathaway? I like Anne Hathaway because she's very attractive and I liked her in The Dark Knight Rises. Yasuko. What actors do you particularly enjoy watching? An actress that I do like is Meryl Streep. Um, I think she's a very powerful actress. I think she does well in any role that's given to her. Um, I, I really do admire her. She's very moving. Anything that she does, she moves me. Are there any particular films in which you enjoyed her performance? Uh, my favorite movie with Meryl Streep is Julie and Julia. Why did you like her performance? Um, she, I think she did a really good job capturing Julia Child. She sounded like her. She was able to just become her. So I loved it. 4.29. Colloquial English Phrases. 1. I like it because she first shows a side of her that is not too girly. 2. I think he just has an intensity and a presence that makes you want to watch him. 3. I think my favourite film and my favourite performance of all time is The Deer Hunter. 4. I think she does well in any role that's given to her. 5. I think she did a really good job capturing Julia Child. 4.30. So, welcome to the program, Danny. Now, you're an ex-burglar yourself, so you can obviously give us the inside story here. Tell me, how long does a burglar usually take to rob a house? I'd say that an experienced burglar would never spend more than 20 minutes in a house. Hmm. 20 minutes maximum, and then out. And how much would they probably take in that time? Maybe 4000 or 5000 bucks worth of goods. It depends on the house. And what are the favorite things for burglars to steal? Well, these days, they're usually looking for things like laptops and tablets. Mm -hmm. They're easy to sell, you know, and not so easy for the owner to identify if the burglar later gets caught. What one thing would be likely to stop a burglar from breaking into a house? I'd say definitely a dog, especially a noisy one. <laughs> Burglars don't like dogs because they're unpredictable. What kind of things would actually make a burglar choose a particular house to break into? Well, it has to look like a house where there'll be things worth taking. So a burglar will usually go for a house that looks expensive in a good area. And they'll also often choose a house where there are trees or bushes outside that are good places to hide while they're watching the house before they break in, and also where they could hide when they come out of the house. Mm. That way, there's less chance of neighbors seeing them. And, obviously, they'll usually wait for the house to be empty before they break in. Mm -hmm. So a burglar wouldn't break in if they thought the owners were at home? Not usually, no. Though there are some burglars who actually prefer it if the owners are at home in bed. Oh, that way, they won't get surprised by them suddenly coming home when they're in the middle of things. Oh, not a very nice thought. Mm. What's the most common time of day for a burglar to break into your house? People always think of burglars as working at night. And, of course, some do. But the majority of burglaries happen between around 10 in the morning and lunchtime. A burglar will watch a house and then wait for the adults to go to work and the kids to go to school... And then he can be sure the house is empty. What's the easiest way for a burglar to break into a house? The easiest way is just taking out a window or a patio door, usually at the back of the house. You can do this really quickly, 
and it doesn't make much noise if you have good equipment, which a serious burglar would usually have. Hmm. And finally, what's the safest room to hide your valuables in? What's the last place a burglar would look? There's a typical order burglars use when they search a house. They start with the main bedroom, because that's often where people leave their valuables, and then the living room. Um, after that, probably the dining room, if there is one, a home office, and then the kitchen. The last place would probably be a kid's bedroom. You wouldn't usually expect to find anything worth taking there. So a child's bedroom is the best place to hide things? Well, in theory. Though, of course, if any burglars out there have been listening to this program, they might start looking there first. <laughs> <laughs> Four point thirty one. One. Burglar. Two. Robber. Three. Shoplifter. Four. Pickpocket. Five. Mugger. Six. Thief. 4.32. Crimes and Criminals. 1. I. Blackmail. Blackmailer. Blackmail. 2. L. Bribery. Bribe. 3. E. Burglary. Burglar. Break in, burgle. 4. D. Forgery. Forger. Forge. 5. K. Fraud. Fraudster. Commit fraud. 6. F. Hacking. Hacker. Hack into. 7. C. Hijacking. Hijacker. Hijack. 8. A. Kidnapping. Kidnapper. Kidnap. 9. O. Mugging. Mugger. Mug. 10. B. Murder. Murderer. Murder. 11. J. Robbery. Robber. Rob. 12. G. Smuggling. Smuggler. Smuggle. 13. P. Stalking. Stalker. Stalk. 14. M. Terrorism. Terrorist. Use violent actions, etc. 15. N. Theft. Thief. Steal. 16. H. Vandalism. Vandal. Vandalize. 4.33. What happens to a criminal? The crime. 1. Carl and Adam committed a crime. They robbed a large supermarket. 2. The police investigated the crime. 3. Carl and Adam were caught driving to the airport in a stolen car. 4. They were arrested and taken to a police station. 5. The police questioned them for 10 hours. 6. Finally, they were charged with armed robbery. The trial. 7. 
Two months later, Carl and Adam appeared in court. 8. They were accused of armed robbery and car theft. 9. Witnesses told the court what they had seen or knew. 10. The jury, of 12 people, looked at and heard all the evidence. 11. After two days, the jury reached their verdict. 12. Carl was found guilty. His fingerprints were on the gun used in the robbery. 13. The judge decided what Carl's punishment should be. 14. He sentenced him to 10 years in prison. 15. There was no proof that Adam had committed the crime. 16. He was acquitted and allowed to go free. 4.34 Uh. Drugs. Judge. Mugger. Punishment. Smuggling. Er. Burglar. Murderer. Ah. Caught. Court. Fraud. You. Accuse. Er. Jury. 4.35 And last on our crime news stories from around the world, a burglar who's been fooling even the most intelligent students. The area near Broadway and 9th Street in New York City is where students often head to when they're looking for an apartment to share. This was something well known to Daniel Stewart Cooper, who also knew that students in a shared house often go out and leave the door unlocked, maybe thinking that another roommate is still inside. This situation suited Cooper perfectly, and he is thought to have committed between 50 and 100 burglaries in the area. It is believed that he was mainly interested in finding illegal substances, but that if he found electronics or other gadgets lying around, he took those too. And he didn't just steal things. Cooper is also said to have made himself at home in the houses, helping himself to food from the refrigerator and even taking a shower. Although he usually tried to make sure that the residents were out, if he did meet people, it's thought that he would pretend to know someone there and so was able to leave without raising suspicions. However, on September 5th, Cooper was finally caught after two students saw him in the area with a laptop and a backpack that he had just stolen from their house. Dylan John, one of the victims, told CBS News that Cooper had taken some food too, Cooper, who ran off as soon as he realized that the students suspected him, was found by the police hiding behind some nearby bushes. Four point thirty six. Simple present. Murderers are usually sentenced to life imprisonment. Present continuous. The trial is being held right now. Present perfect. My car has been stolen. Simple past. Jim was arrested last month. Past continuous. The theater was being rebuilt when it was set on fire. Past perfect. We saw that one of the windows had been broken. Future. The prisoner will be released next month. The verdict is going to be given tomorrow. Infinitive. People used to be imprisoned for stealing bread. Base form. You can be fined for parking at a bus stop. Gerund. He paid a fine to avoid being sent to jail. 4.37 1. They say that the fire was started deliberately. 
It is said that the fire was started deliberately. People think that the mayor will resign. It is thought that the mayor will resign. 2. People say the man is in his 40s. The man is said to be in his 40s. The police believe he has left the country. He is believed to have left the country. 4.38 And for our last story today, have you ever wondered what it would be like to be eaten by a tiger? Well, now we know, thanks to Sundari, a seven-year-old Siberian tiger living at Longleat Safari Park. Last week, when it snowed, the zookeepers decided to build some snowmen to entertain the tigers, and they hid a tiny video camera inside one of the snowmen to video the tigers' reactions. At first, the tigers just sniffed at the snowman, but then one of them, named Sundari, began attacking the snowman and started to eat it and the camera. However, she didn't like the taste of the camera, so after a while she spat it out. Amazingly, the camera hadn't stopped recording and was still working when the zookeepers recovered it. The video that the hidden camera had taken was incredible. For the first time, you could feel what it would be like to be attacked by a tiger and see its open mouth coming at you and see its enormous razor-sharp teeth and its rough tongue. In fact, a spokesman for the safari park said that the shots of Sundari's teeth were so clear that it gave them the chance to do a quick health check on her mouth, gums, and teeth. 4.39 1. Jack offered to drive me to the airport. I promise not to tell anybody. 2. The doctor advised me to rest. I persuaded my sister not to go out with Max. 3. I apologized for being so late. The police accused Carl of stealing the car. 4.40 Accuse Admit Advise Agree Convince Deny Insist Invite Offer. Order. Persuade. Promise. Refuse. Regret. Remind. Suggest. Threaten. 4.41 1. He offered to make some coffee. 2. He refused to go. 3. He agreed to help me. 4. He promised to call me. 5. He reminded me to lock the door. 6. He advised me to buy a new car. 7. He invited me to have dinner. 8. He denied breaking the window. 9. He admitted stealing the money. 10. He regretted marrying Susan. 11. He suggested going to a dance club. 12. The police accused him of stealing the laptop. 4.42 1. I didn't break the window. 2. He denied breaking the window. 2. I wish I hadn't married Susan.
he regretted marrying Susan. 3. I'll call you, believe me. He promised to call me. 4. Let's go to a dance club. He suggested going to a dance club. 5. You stole the laptop. The police accused him of stealing the laptop. 6. No, I won't go. He refused to go. 7. Okay, I'll help you. He agreed to help me. 8. Remember to lock the door. He reminded me to lock the door. 9. I'll make some coffee. He offered to make some coffee. 10. Would you like to have dinner? He invited me to have dinner. 11. Yes, it was me. I stole the money. He admitted stealing the money. 12. You should buy a new car. He advised me to buy a new car. 4.43. Journalists and people in the media. 1. Critic. 2. Sports commentator. 3. Reporter. 4. Editor. 5. News anchor. 6. Freelance journalist. 7. Newscaster. 8. Paparazzi. 9. Advice columnist. 4.44. Adjectives to describe the media. 1. D. The reporting in the paper was very sensational. 2. E. The news on Channel 12 is really biased. 3. B. I think the New York Times is the most objective of the Sunday papers. 4. A. The movie review was very accurate. 5. C. I think the report was censored. 4.45. The language of headlines. 1. A. Famous actress in restaurant bill spat. 2. E. Team manager to quit after shocking defeat. 3. G. Prince to wed 18-year-old TV soap star. 4. L. President back senator in latest scandal. 5. I. Tarantino tab to direct new thriller. 6. B. Thousands of jobs axed by U.S. companies. 7. K. Stock market hit by oil fears. 8. C. Police quiz witness in murder trial. 
Nine. D. Astronaut bids to be first man on Mars. Ten. J. Politicians clash over new car tax proposal. Eleven. H. Tennis star vows to avenge defeat. Twelve. F. Actor and wife split over affair with cleaner. Four point forty six. Brad Pitt said recently, "They call my kids by their names. They shove cameras in their faces. I really believe there should be a law against it." He was talking, of course, about paparazzi. But are the paparazzi really as bad as Brad Pitt says they are? Today in the studio with me is Jennifer Boole, who is an actual—is it paparazzi or paparazzo? Paparazzo for a man, paparazza for a woman. Paparazzi is the plural. Hmm. So. Jennifer, are you good, bad, or in between? Well, I think I'm a good girl, but some people would probably not like me. A lot of people say there's a working relationship between celebrities and paparazzi. Would you say that was true? That celebrities actually tell you where they're going to be? Yes, of course. That happens all the time. Uh huh. But I think that's what a lot of the public doesn't realize. You know, people shout at us and insult us when there's a big crowd of us around. Let's say Britney Spears or Lindsay Lohan. Hmm. I just want to tell them that they called us. After we've sold the photos, we split the money between the stars and us. I've often thought that must be true. I mean. Nobody just goes to the gym with their hair done and makeup on unless they're actually expecting to be photographed. Exactly, but don't get me wrong. It's not like all the celebrities want to be photographed. If a celebrity wants to go out and avoid the paparazzi, it's pretty easy to do. Hmm. Celebrities that don't like it rarely get photographed. They very rarely get photographed. Give me some examples of celebrities who genuinely don't want to be photographed, like. Who really hates it? Julia Roberts hates it. Kate Bosworth hates it. Are photos of them worth more money if they hate it? It depends. No, not necessarily. Because they don't get photographed often, then nobody sees them in magazines, and they lose interest in them because they become boring.、Mm -hmm. What shot have you taken that you got the most money for? Probably one of the shots that sold the best that I didn't expect, didn't even know, was Paris Hilton carrying the Bible right before she went to jail. <laughs> there were lots of paparazzi there, but I was the only one that got the Bible. Do you think we need stricter laws to keep paparazzi away? There are already enough laws. We don't need more laws or anti-paparazzi laws or anything else.、Hmm. There are places where celebrities can go to where they know they won't be followed,、mm -hmm. and places where they know they will be. For example, we don't go into restaurants, we don't go into stores, and of course we don't go into people's homes. That's private property.、Mm -hmm. But a beach or a park isn't. So you don't think that being followed and Photographed by the paparazzi is really stressful for celebrities. I think there are only a few people for whom it's really and truly stressful. I'd say that in most cases, the star not only doesn't mind, but has actually told the paparazzi, "This is where I'm going to be this afternoon." Hmm. Fascinating. Thank you very much for coming into the studio,、mm -hmm. Jennifer Boole. Everybody. <laughs> Four point forty-eight, a short film on the speed of news. Hi, my name is Matt Wilder. I'm a freelance journalist based in Washington D.C. At the moment, I'm trying to find a good story. I have a six o'clock deadline, but nothing's going on. I know. I'll see what topics are trending on Twitter. 
Today, we live in the era of new media. People can access the news at any time, from any place, on all kinds of digital devices. The internet and social media sites, such as Twitter and Facebook, allow these news consumers to become news producers. If you want to be a journalist, all you have to do is post an article online, and it can be read instantly by anyone, anywhere in the world. Journalism has changed a lot during the first days of the newspaper, and most of these changes have been driven by technology. There's no better place to discover this than Washington, D.C., home of the museum. There are over 30,000 newspapers here, covering over 500 years of news. This is the Boston Newsletter, thought to be the first continuously published newspaper in North America. This edition, from 1718, reports on the sensational killing of Edward Teach, better known as Blackbeard, believed to be one of the most dangerous pirates at the time. Reporting in the early days of journalism must have been very difficult. Journalists would ride their horses to the nearest town that had a printing press. Their reports were then published in a newspaper, which is often just a single sheet of paper, and distributed on horseback. The roads were bad, so it was very difficult to send news over long distances. By the time most people read these newspapers, the news was often very out of date. This all changed when the first telegraph line was built in 1844. Suddenly, journalists could send stories quickly. The telegraph is said to have revolutionized news reporting. This new style of journalism came just in time for the American Civil War. For the first time, News could be sent at the same time as battles were being fought. War correspondents and the stories they sent became very popular. But there were still problems. These war reports were very biased because journalists represented their own side in the war. There was no objectivity, and reports were usually censored by the army or the government. So stories were often inaccurate and sometimes completely wrong. It wasn't until the invention of radio and television that news could be broadcast live. This completely transformed news and created the age of the mass media, where news could be communicated to a huge audience. Throughout the 20th century, demand for news stories increased, and news technology continued to advance. By the end of the century, there were hundreds of cable TV channels, lots of 24-hour news channels, and the internet had been invented. Suddenly, we were in the information age. This is the HP New Media Gallery. It shows the news as it is today. Visitors to this exhibit are placed right at the center of the digital news revolution. They are instantly connected to the day's news by live Twitter feeds, showing the day's trending news stories. They can also check out major news stories, which were first reported on social media. These pictures of a plane landing on New York's Hudson River were taken on a smartphone and uploaded to Twitter seconds after the incident had occurred. Speaking of smartphones, ah, oh, fantastic. A tweet from the White House. Oh. There's a big announcement in 25 minutes. I better go. Bye.